Hi, I'm Gregory O. Oh, welcome to NYO Replay. Today we're going to talk to Emily LaBelle and James O'Callaghan. We're going to talk about the pieces that they were commissioned to write for the National Youth Orchestra of Canada. We'll talk about stuff that they're writing now, stuff they're doing now and seeing now, and also about thoughts about the future. Please welcome Emily and James. Hi, I'm, I'm Emily LaBelle. Uh, I'm a composer and educator currently based in Edmonton. Um, I've been living here for about two years, so living in the prairies and, and the music scene out here is still very new to me, but I'm really enjoying it. Um, previous to that, I lived down in the United States for a few years in Montana and uh, did most of my musical training in Toronto. Um, studying trumpet performance and then eventually uh, finding my way to being a composer in my mid to late 20s. So I didn't sort of take, I guess, the, the most traditional route to, uh, to studying composition. I did a degree in audio engineering, played some trumpet, took some time off. Um, and I worked with the NYO in 2015, I want to say. Yes, um, and the previous year to doing that, I was really fortunate to work with Gregory um, and part of the NYO on a, on a piece that I wrote for the brass section, percussionists and double bassists, which was a lot of fun and um, introduced me to the organization and to working with larger ensembles. So that was a really special opportunity. And then the following year was fortunate enough to write for the whole orchestra. Um, that led me to one of my current positions where I now um, am affiliate composer with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. And I've been there working with the orchestra, doing education programs, writing some pieces, learning about writing for orchestra um, for the past, oh, two and a half years. So uh, that's sort of my life right now in between Toronto and Edmonton when, when possible. My name is James O'Callaghan. Um, I'm a composer, sound artist, and I um, live in Montreal mostly. I'm kind of like half time between Montreal and New York these days. I don't really know. I'm sort of a nomadic person somehow. Um, and my pathway into composition was, um, I guess, like Emily, is a bit strange somehow. And I mean, we're all strange, so that's normal. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I had no more formal music training until university, um, still don't play any instruments, um, so I was very like autodidactic, just making techno kind of in my basement in high school kind of thing, figuratively, <laughs> and uh, then really was interested in all kinds of fine performing arts and dabbled around a bit in my um, undergraduate, Simon Fraser, which was very you know, contemporary focused experimental school. So it's kind of one of the only schools that would have let me in for music anyway. <laughs> and um, kind of wiggled my way through that and um, starting with uh, electroacoustic music uh, and then gradually um, falling in love with and becoming more and more interested in writing for classical musicians as well. And now I do a little bit of uh, all of that. I continue to make electroacoustic music. I write for classical musicians. I combine the two very often, most of the time. And uh, sound art installations and gallery contexts. And um, since last year, I've gotten back to my musical roots and I'm making techno again, which is super fun. So. <laughs> That's, uh, that's the upshot. Uh, I worked with uh, the National Youth Orchestra of Canada in 2013, um, which was uh, actually like my first real kind of fully paid commission to write a piece of music. Uh, and it happened to line up with uh, it being my uh, master's thesis piece as well when I was studying at McGill. So um, it was a very like uh, kind of pivotal and important uh, career moment and artistic moment for me. Can you guys talk about like a pivotal experience you had when you were, you know, getting into composition that really you feel changed the, your trajectory or uh, how you write or what you're writing? 
I, I really just got very hooked into the idea of making concert music through studying at Simon Fraser with people like Barry Truax and Hildegard Westerkamp um, because it opened my, idea, my mind to the idea that music could be an art form that had some connection with the real world, that had some very concrete connection with our personal memories, our society, our environment, these kinds of things. And so that really stimulated me to try to find my way in music coming from other more representational art forms. I had a lot more experience in visual art and film and theater and these kinds of things where, you know, whether there's a clear narrative or kind of um, whether there's text or, you know, you're trying to represent something that we recognize in the real world. Um, I really latched on to that, particularly in my early work, the idea that um, music could have this same kind of connection that felt more personal somehow. Similarly to James, I was just thinking about this connection here. I did my undergrad at York University in Toronto, which is kind of similar to Simon Fraser in that um, it's not a classical program. It's it's a faculty of fine arts and, and they kind of let you in and let you go do what you want to do and so I was lucky that way I don't think I would have survived in a classical <laughs> program or or become a composer I don't think I would have felt like there was a place for me and I think part of that for me was that I played all this different kind of music and then uh, studying audio studying audio engineering most of the music we recorded as students or were, was involved in, or when I learned to go do live sound at clubs, I mean, none of that was sort of in the classical realm. <laughs> so I feel like I, I have this deep love and deep appreciation for a lot of that standard repertoire, but then I've, you know, gone and done all these other things that's allowed me to, um, to kind of have my, a breadth of experience, I guess you would say, and in, in lots of different kinds of music and, and going to York where they didn't really sort of put you into a genre. Uh, I think they're a little ahead of their time <laughs> at that time when I was there and just kind of, okay, you're a music student or you're a fine arts student, go, go take classes, go learn, go figure out what you wanna do. Walking into a first year composition class and, and the teacher just kind of um, his name's Bill Westcott and he's a ragtime jazz piano player and he teaches you bar talk and ragtime jazz and all sorts of different things and just someone kind of giving me permission that it was okay to be there and that I could learn this stuff and do this stuff. Um, like looking back on that, that was really powerful. I think somehow at that point in my life, I needed someone to kind of give me permission that it was okay to be there, to, to learn how to compose, to uh, to like give you a little bit of confidence and, and really, really good feedback, astute feedback on, um, on your work. Um, I don't think if I had had that teacher and that experience at York, I would be doing what I'm doing now. And it's certainly pivotal or influenced me in terms of how I teach and how I mentor now that I'm in a role where I'm doing, I'm just starting to do more of that. I've, I, thought a lot about those people who offered me those things and how I can kind of um, also be that sort of support and vote of confidence for for people who are just kind of taking their first steps into uh, to creating music however they want to create music. Both of you mentioned going to less, I guess, traditional um, undergrads, uh, SFU, York, probably like, you know, in the States with Cal Arts and uh, you know, Wesley. Yeah, and Martin, 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 Martin. Yeah. Um, so what, if, if you were uh, redesigning music education at any level, just pick something that you feel you've thought about or you feel strongly about, what, what changes would you make? I'm going to be slightly political for a moment. <laughs> yes. um, Bring back all the music programs in the public schools and properly fund them all the way from junior kindergarten up to grade 12 or 13 or whatever we have. We, we were just touching on sort of barriers to access on, on a very different realm, but um, you know, 70s, 80s, I think part of the 90s had a fair bit of money for arts education and there's after school programs and there's band programs and any kid in the school system had 
access to the arts. Um, and a lot of that has been clawed back. It doesn't only benefit those who go on to study, um, but I think you end up educating all young people to see the value of the arts and to want to go on to be adults who support arts and culture in our community. The nature of what that education looks like is pretty important. And I think that it's um, no surprise that, you know, or I mean, just it, it is a coincidence that you have Emily and I here who both kind of said that like we would have washed out of a conventional music program in our undergrad if we went to a conservatory style school, if that was this, like either through lack of interest or through the kind of um, draconian kind of systematic structures of music education that are so prevalent in conservatories. Uh, for people who have a little bit of a different perspective, a little bit of a different background, a little bit of a different interest in what they want to do musically as artists, there are, it's, it's quite poor in music education, I think, around the world compared to other art forms, you know? Um, and it really stems, I think, from this obsession, this kind of like museum preservation obsession of holding up the standard of what it means to be a musical artist as a kind of post hoc appreciation of a very short period of time, we're talking about a couple hundred years, a few hundred years in Central Europe of music that was made by and for old dead white guys, you know? And I had no particular interest in this music when I was coming in to study music. I think it's fine and good, like I like all art, but I didn't see why that would be the, the necessary background that I should have to have to be a composer. We lose so many people in music education and it's because largely of this kind of exclusionary practice of saying that like, this is the kind of music that you have to study and make in order to be an artist and nothing else is valid. I have a guilty pleasure, which is the poetry of E.E. E. Cummings. And, but my favorite thing that he wrote was um, his essay to poets, I, I don't remember it exactly, but he wrote an essay to poets. And he's, the problem with being a poet, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, is that everyone's trying to tell you what to do and how to write. And to try to be yourself in, in this kind of environment is, is impossible. And if at the end of your career, you've written one line of poem, one poem, consider yourself lucky. And <laughs> does that sound awful? It is, unless you don't think it's awful. And to me, it's not awful. But what, what are your thoughts on that? How do you, I guess, as a composer or an artist or whatever you consider yourself, find your voice or do the things you want to do without, and without, with all these influences coming at you, like they, they, that are, you have to trust because they're trying to make you better, but maybe they're beating you down this, the same canon that isn't really progressing anywhere. I don't really like this romantic idea that, you know, we need to suffer as artists and <laughs> go through, you know, all this horrible experience and doubt and, um, you know, formalization of our practice in order to get a little nugget at the end. I think that, you know, <laughs> we don't need to idealize that kind of um, structure, but, you know, I, I don't want to be misunderstood in thinking that that means that there should be no uh, encouragement of reflection or rigor or critique or discussion in art making, you know? I think that, I mean, that is a risk of, of programs that are more open-ended and are more like, find your voice, do what you want, you know? That's the kind of beautiful encouragement that I got in my undergrad was like, hey, you know, you just write whatever you want. And so then if your kind of first intuitions are never questioned, by your teachers or by your peers, you know, it's kind of, you, you don't have the opportunity to have that dialogue outside of yourself in order to grow and, and explore. And, you know, people who are self-motivated to do that, uh, you know, can get through that experience and find that elsewhere outside of the institution. But I think that it's really important for institutions to, um, encourage and foster that environment of critique. And that's another, like the flip side of it is that that's something that's also quite poor, I think in music education, you know, to make a comparison again in visual art, like the crit session is such an important 
part of that learning experience that you go around the room, look at your classmates' work, and you talk about it, you know, which is something that's kind of taboo in music education, you know? It's kind of like the discussion that you have is with the masters of the past as conveyed through your mentor. And that's about it, you know? Like if a composition student were to critique another composition student's work, I mean, it happens, of course, but there is not really any kind of structure in most of the educational settings that I've been in that encourages that. In fact, it's quite often actively discouraged. It's like, well, you know, student composers don't know enough to offer, you know, critique to their peers. So, um, so they should just, you know, really listen to their teachers and that's it. And I think that that's just a kind of a toxic idea. So, I mean, these are the ideas behind initiatives like the Montreal Contemporary Music Lab that we started kind of in reaction to that um, situation like 10 years ago now almost that was like, that we're not getting this in our schools. So how can we make a situation outside of the institution that fosters that sense of peer support and peer critique and peer encouragement and how we make healthy relationships between composers and performers and media artists rather than this kind of hierarchical structure that necessitates an obsession with the past and this kind of romantic suffering idea that you should have to experience that um, kind of destruction and rebuilding of the self <laughs> through this model. I think there's an alternate way to go through it. Because so much of our, our sort of lives <laughs> Once, once we leave our formal education, if we've had formal ed education, but dealing dealing with writing grants and and um, working with musicians is learning how to take feedback and and use that feedback in a productive way, and yet we're not taught that skill, right? <laughs> um, we're not we're not mentored to to have those sorts of dialogues, um, and so I think you know. Also, James sort of touched on personal experience. For me, my undergrad was very sort of, oh, go do what you want and very encouraging. Not a lot of critical self-reflection. Oh, you wrote something down, it's good <laughs> sort of process. And um, then walking into like a much more traditional program for my doctorate, feeling very sort of alien in the program for the first few years, very unsure of myself because everything there told me I didn't belong there, that I didn't have the right skills, that I didn't have the right education. I hadn't gone to the right school for my undergraduate. Um, and then at some point realizing that uh, actually all those experiences that I had were very valuable. <laughs> Let's listen. Uh to some music now. Uh, we'll start with Emily. We're gonna listen to an excerpt of, I have to read this off my notes, Flora McDonald Dennison in Bon Echo Park. Uh, and this is performed by Continuum at the Music Gallery, I think. And um, can you just set it up for us? Uh, the title and, or anything you wanna mention about the, the piece before we listen to a bit. So this was a piece uh, that I wrote in 2019 for the Continuum Ensemble in Toronto. Um, it was written in celebration or in honor of their 35th anniversary. So uh, Ryan Scott, the artistic director, got in touch with me uh, and asked me to write a piece that could be played for an ensemble of open instrumentation. Um, with the idea that they could kind of have this piece in their repertoire and use in different circumstances. The piece, I knew sort of generally what the instrumentation was going to be for this particular concert. So it's open instrumentation in that uh, any, any group of players can play it. Uh, and it's sort of, if you remember those choose your own adventure books from when you were a kid, the score is kind of set up that way and that people can choose uh, a line on the score and then switch over to another line as they wish, uh, depending on what their instrument is capable of. So there's certain parts that are more percussive and some that are harmonics and some that are sustained. I decided to write the piece about um, a historical figure in Canada. Um, she was... Uh, 
a member of um, uh, this organization that looked after Bon Echo Provincial Park in Ontario. Uh, I have a long relationship with canoeing through many Ontario parks and that's a really important part of who I am. So I wanted to take a little bit of Canada and put it into this, this piece uh, because the artistic director really wanted something that was Canadian. Um, and I always have a hard time with the idea of what Canadian is or how Canada should sound or what that even means. So I decided uh, to, to, to take a very sort of personal approach to that. And I went um, with this particular figure because she was, she was very much part of the women's rights movement in Canada and um, looked after this provincial park and was sort of a protector of two things that are important to me, <laughs> um, human rights and, and the provincial park system. So I sort of did a soundscape, sound world, imagining this, this uh, flora in, in Bon Echo Provincial Park. So we're gonna listen to Flora McDonald, Denison in Bon Echo Park as performed by Continuo. I wanted to ask you, Emily, uh, just to follow up. Um, what are what are the politics of volume in Western classical music? You know, uh, it's a it's a funny thing because uh, you talked about uh, the piece I I refer to as Workers Onion, and then you know there's also Coming Together, uh, and to a certain extent in C, which are the three greatest open instrumentation hits, and they're all in my experience, pretty loud, pretty like <laughs> aggressive, I guess you could say. This was not an aggressive piece. And the and also the piece I would say you wrote for NYO would not be considered necessarily in the same uh, textural milieu. But so what are the politics of volume in, in classical composition? I think for a long time, I really pushed against the idea that there needed to be a fortissimo <laughs> in my piece and a climax three quarters of the way through for it to be a good piece of music. Um, I feel that a lot of ideas about what makes good music aesthetically or otherwise uh, was pushed quite hard in uh, juries when I was in music school. And I think for a while, consciously and unconsciously in my work, there is a very, I'm gonna say quite consciously, a, a decision to not do that, um, that, my music didn't need to do that. I didn't need to fit into a sound world that uh, historically hasn't been very welcoming to, to much else beyond this sort of narrow scope of who writes music and what is good music. So um, I think for a long time, 
my dynamics didn't get much louder than, oh, maybe a mezzo forte. Um, I also, for a while, put a lot of mezzo fortes in my piece because a conductor told me that mezzo fortes are indecisive and, and my reaction <laughs> was um, to be a bit difficult because I don't like it uh, when, you know, someone tells you what a, a dynamic should be, mean in your piece and that you're in, that it's indecisive. So I think... Don't be so mezzo forte. I mean, you get, you know, get off the fence. Get off the fence. <laughs> I can't believe that. Wow. So I think, you know, like on a like personal political level, there there was a way to kind of situate myself and what I wanted to do. Um, that being said, you know, I, I the last piece I wrote for the TSO had some pretty loud moments in it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, and big brass parts too. Big brass parts, and that's okay too, right? I think you can, um, I think you can explore sort of different things in different mediums too. And part of the fun of writing for orchestra is <laughs> it can, it can be kind of like that loud and all-consuming all sound, but I, you know, I'm not going to do it the same way Mahler does it. So, uh, James, we're going to listen to an excerpt of your piece, O oh, Cocoon. Um, this is performed by New Music Concerts. O oh, Cocoon is my most recent work. I completed it um, beginning of December. And it very much is a COVID piece. It's something that was created in that context. And so the commission was from New Music Concerts for a, an ensemble of my choice. I could choose um, which instrumentation to work with from 10 to 15 players, which is a, a beautiful and rare opportunity. So that there, you know, it was an opportunity to kind of um, connect to the community in a way that, you know, we can't right now. So it had that kind of personal affectation of kind of trying to bring a community together despite the, the conditions. Uh, once I was able to kind of conceptualize it quite differently and think this is an occasion to make a different kind of artwork, then I really fell in love with the project and found that I was able to do things that um, were quite exciting for me. So uh, as soon as I kind of like understood that, well, I don't need to write a score because they're not playing together in a space. There's no conductor. They don't need to synchronize necessarily. So I don't need to make like a click track of them like playing this kind of notated music. Um, but of course I still do want to like address their training and write notes and, you know, do things that, that are, you know, show all of their amazing talent and creativity, right? So I came up with this kind of hybrid situation where I had like, notated fragments and I had um, kind of text instructions for certain like listening exercises and improvisations that I wanted them to do to just generate a lot of material. And all of this was kind of centered around the confluence of ideas of um, kind of a starting off point for the piece was uh, inspiration from uh, Bjork's album Vespertine, which came out in 2001, like at the peak of peer-to-peer um, -peer file sharing services like Napster. But I was like, oh gosh, people are going to be listening to this on their homes. There might be a live streaming component. Finally, there wasn't, but loss of fidelity, loss of clarity, miscommunication, loss of connection is something that's so poignant in our personal lives right now and the way that we interact with the world. And so, you know, when that happens in an audio setting, how can we kind of like learn from the past, you know, to see um, what people have done in that situation. So I made all these texts and notated fragments that I sent to the musicians, and I really kind of didn't know what the piece would look like. But when I got back the video of them playing, it was just so phenomenally inspiring, you know, to see all the kind of pent up creative energy that came out through what these uh, 10 players were doing. And um, immediately I just started to play around and I was very lucky to be, um, kind of living semi-temporarily <laughs> in this um, heritage church building in Troy, New York, when I was working on the piece with my partner who's doing a curatorial residency there. Um, so I was able to, you know, use a projector and project the uh, musicians in the space and kind of try to simulate this ghostly feeling that they're somehow playing together in a shared space, which is a church, which is like the model for a concert hall. So that kind of like uncanny thing was what really was the seed of the rest of the work for me. 
and this kind of idea of out of body experiences and dissociation, you know, which comes from the very like so personal place for me and my own like history of mental health and so on. So it was a way to kind of bring all of those things together and to kind of process something that was very personal and emotional for me um, and scratch a really old itch to like be a filmmaker. That's great. So let's watch a bit of O Cocoon performed by New Music Concerts. <laughs> I find that um, the biggest problem I have with um, listening to electronic and acoustic music or electric acoustic music is that my brain, because of my eyes, separates electronic sounds from acoustic sounds. And there's a hierarchy of sound still. Um, and what I really liked was that I couldn't tell what was electronic and what was um, uh, uh, acoustic because when I'm I'm listening to a celesta play and then I see a harpsichord being played or I see a piano or I hear uh, violin harmonics and then they turn into something else and so that really uh, took got got that prejudice away from me uh, and so it's like oil and water how do we mix these two seemingly mm -hmm. disparate elements and it, it really worked well so is live music best is it uh, do we all miss live music so I've basically been sequestered in Edmonton by myself since since March, and I have to, I'll, I'll be really honest. I, I got to uh, like zoom into um, a live rehearsal of the TSO at some point in November when, for like a brief period of time, they're allowed to have more than ten people on stage, and uh, even through my crummy well, they're okay speakers here, um, zooming in and seeing and like hearing that hall because that hall is, despite all its, you know, all the acoustics that people complain about, that hall feels like home to me. I grew up going to concerts there and um, I, I got very sort of choked up and emotional listening to that on, um, on, on Zoom and I haven't really had that experience with anything else I've listened to on the computer. Um, you know, all these sort of like family squares <laughs> uh, concerts that have been on live stream and such haven't done that for me, but I, I miss I miss the sound of sounds in, in a certain space and I miss sitting in a hall with people and um, I do miss live music a lot. How about you, James? It's been a quite a, an interesting and touching period for me because um, I spent uh, about three years of my childhood dropped out of school and I was kind of like very isolated. I cut off from like all my friends and family basically and just stayed home. It was a very like troubled period for me. And so it's been very scary to kind of go back in that mode, which was like probably the most difficult time of my life and to have a lot of like memories coming back from the past. But um, there were a lot of beautiful experiences in that time as well. You know, like I remember like I, I got, you know, like a lot of <laughs> young kids around that time with, uh, especially if you're taking outside of the school context, I was very into video games. And so like, I remember, I don't know how old I was, maybe like 12 or 11 or something playing like an old, 
online role-playing game, EverQuest, and I was like an ogre in a swamp, and there were, it was nighttime, and there were frogs kind of like spatialized chirping around me in the video game, and I had this kind of like, I don't know, like, you know, I'm 12 years old, so I wasn't like mitigated by any other experiences, but I felt like almost like an ayahuasca, like awakening, like a hallucinatory <laughs> experience somehow, where I was like, wow, this is like just as immersive and, and real of an experience as those that I have, you know, in my corporal form. And so, you know, kind of reconnecting those things and getting back into my body and understanding it better has been a huge part of this last year. But like exploring that virtuality and the beauty and the poetry that can happen there is something that I, you know, want to confront again in this situation, you know, because, um, there's so much that can happen there as well. Yeah, so I, I'm trying I, to do both, you know, like plan for the future and hope for the return to this thing that I miss, but also take this moment to kind of reflect and, and look at what we can do right now. That's really, um, that's a really good answer. <laughs> uh, no, I was just going to say flippantly that uh, I might have cried at the end of Final Fantasy X. <laughs> yeah, I won't tell you why because I don't want to give away the spoilers. But boy, you seem to have a perspective on technology, and Emily, maybe you can talk about this too because I know you use a lot of electronics, um, of like a more welcoming look at electronics that it does is not actually counter to humanity or human emotion. To me, it was never a question to like that. That's my. That's my mother tongue, you know, like when I started making music, that's how I made it. I didn't know any other way. That was the only means that I had to make music was with technology and computers, you know, because in the small town where I grew up, there was one piano teacher who was apparently really mean. So my mom didn't want to enroll me in lessons. So like the only access I had to music making was through technology. And so that to me is such a human experience because it was so much about processing my own human emotions. And then when you get into recorded sound, to me, it has so much to do with memory and personal experience through whatever means, whether it's electronics or theatricality or just the sheer emotion and expressivity of it. Then I have that like, oh, my gosh, that's another human there. You know, there, there's, oh, there's other humans there. And you kind of feel a little bit less alone in the world, you know, and that I think is what art is all about. And why I make art is like empathy. You know, I think art is just an empathy machine. And so technology is a means to connect to that. How about you, Emily? Are the electronics that you use, is that a way of incorporating like almost uh, in a contradictory uh, fashion, more of natural elements in your music or nature around you or? It's very much a part of my life. I have training in audio engineering, but I think my sort of approach in terms of using electronics in uh, music is it's just kind of like another color, another tool, another palette of, of, of sounds. Um, so artistically, that's how I, that, that is how I approach it in my, in my music. So sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Thinking a lot about grief this year and how a lot of us are sort of collectively <laughs> grieving um, and at other times in my life have have um, continued to work through through grief and and through all sorts of life things and this year I made a very conscious decision to kind of pull back from forcing myself to work or not forcing myself but having to work or working and did things like gardening and did some online teaching and walked my dog and looked after my neighbor and um, didn't kind of uh, interface with technology so much and, and haven't really found solutions to using it in my work at this time. And um, that was sort of my, my reaction and approach uh, for quite a while this year. And then just sort of slowly finding my way back into um, what making art right now means, how I might use technology in my art, um, what the concert hall means, what my role as a composer is right now. I have to steer back to the essential things we need to cover, uh, which is working with NYO and um, also just writing for the orchestra, your experiences. So uh, maybe we'll start with you, James. 
can you uh and, and i should just preface it by saying i think what was interesting is that i remember both of your pieces when we were rehearsing them and i think both of your pieces were challenging for the orchestra in really different ways so uh can you talk about your experience with the orchestra you know writing for it coming in well, as I mentioned at the, in my introduction, it was a very kind of pivotal moment for me in my own development, just in terms of the timing of it, um, because it was the first big commission that I had had. It was the first um, real performance of an orchestral piece I had had, apart from I was very fortuitous to have a few reading sessions in, in BC because the two major orchestras there are very generous in offering reading sessions to student composers. So I had that experience going in that really helped me, but um, it all lined up very nicely with the timing of working on my master's thesis. And I was able to use that piece as my thesis and um, really try to make a, a very personal statement with it and to try and kind of summarize the work that I had been doing up until that point. So um, it was a great opportunity artistically in that sense. And I feel that I was really able to like quite um, in detail realize the things that I had been thinking about um, and, um, and to take the risks that I had been wanting to take, even you know, writing a piece for electronics and orchestra that might not have that experience of working with electronics before was felt like quite a risk. And I had, you know, people left, right and center telling me like, don't do that, James. Now is yeah. not the time to take risks. You know, you just, just, you know, shut up and write a conventional orchestral piece. It'll be good for you. Eat your vegetables kind of thing. And I just, you know, I, I just can't. So uh, I kind of wrote the piece that I wanted to write and um, it went quite well, I think. So I think just letting myself play with the conditions that were handed to me and make something out of it that excited me rather than like, oh, I have to, you know, make a different version of it that's going to be less good or less complete or less whole of a vision than I want um, was, I think, a really a, a kind of a, a pivotal moment for me artistically. And then, you know, seeing the musicians like rehearsing it without the electronics, suddenly I come in with my laptop, play with them, then it's like light bulb moment, it seemed. And like everybody was like, oh, okay, this is what this piece is about, you know, it kind of gave them a window into it. And I think that the enthusiasm and the passion and the dedication that came out of those players, you know, was amazing. And I had a lot of like older mentor composers kind of telling me like, you really won the lottery here because, you know, in so many professional orchestras, it's kind of like there's a gig mentality. A lot of the time you don't get as much rehearsal time. People are kind of, they have to be efficient, you know, because it's so expensive to run an orchestra, right? So there are all these reasons that writing orchestral music is such a challenge that kind of didn't apply in the youth orchestra context where you have these amazing musicians who are like as good as professional players, but, without the kind of cynicism of the professional orchestra context. So um, all of those things made it just a joy to work with the orchestra. And, you know, they're always kind of, you know, with a beast of that many moving parts, they're always like complications and bureaucracy and, you know, difficult moments. But I come out of that experience with just so much um, gratitude and it ended up being quite an impactful piece for me because it, um, at first, it was nominated for a Juno uh, for Classical Composition of the Year, which I, I was then the youngest person who had been nominated in that category. And so it really like kicked off my career in a way after that. And I started to get a lot of interest. So I just feel like really lucky that I had that chance at such an early age. Um, now, Emily, did you want to talk about your experience? I loved working with that um, orchestra because there was such enthusiasm. Um, people really wanted to play and they really wanted to play your music well. And that was evident in the performers, but also the mentors. And I just think of how generous all the mentors were um, with their time, with getting getting everyone ready before, before rehearsals of the whole piece. And so I really appreciated that. Um, and being able to talk to a few people before I started writing the piece, I was able to know that uh, there was great percussionists, they had a lot of experience. So I wrote a very technically challenging percussion part, knowing that they would enjoy the challenge and rise to the challenge. 
Um, and then some of the other parts, knowing that there was maybe some less experienced players there, uh, I wrote them a little bit differently, knowing sort of what challenges they'd be able to embrace and what might be kind of too much. So the piece was really personalized that way in a way I don't think I would write now for an orchestra, but that was the right context for that. Um, and within that was able to take some risks with, I prepared the piano, I detuned, there's two harps, so I detuned one of the harps. Uh, they maybe love that, they love feathers, it. But, you know, sometimes you ruffle a few feathers and, and it's worth, worth it in the end. And I think, I think in the end, the people playing those parts bought into it, so. Um, that was really wonderful. But I also think I learned a lot about uh, sort of the hierarchy of orchestras, how many administrators are involved, how things are communicated or not communicated, um, and also the role of conductors and that you might have a conductor who um, doesn't really love your music <laughs> and, and it's not their thing, but they still have to find a way <laughs> To have the orchestra perform it and I think I realized and I may be wrong but I think in this case the conductor wasn't super into what I what I do in my music and so I think that was a challenge for him and then it was also a challenge for me to learn how to communicate with confidence what I was after why this piece was important um, why there didn't need to be a triple fortissimo um, you know and and like and how your pieces kind of juxtapose with other pieces on the program. So Hulse the Planets was like the other <laughs> piece, which I've played as a brass player many times. And, you know, it's like this huge piece with like these blastissimo parts. And then there was my piece. And so I think uh, it was challenging for the conductor. It was challenging for me. Um, I had a hard time at that time knowing how to kind of like advocate for myself and was worried about being perceived as being difficult. And that's a real, I think, balance a lot of composers <laughs> struggle with. Um, and I, so I think I came out of that learning a lot about myself, the organization, how to learned a lot and carried a lot of that forward to other experiences. Um, so yeah, there is, a, there is a big learning curve there. And I think now, you know, in the moment, I was actually kind of unhappy with my piece. And I think it was kind of like all the struggles around having to learn how to communicate really colored um, how I felt about my work. And it took about a year later to go back and hear the piece and, and be like, oh, actually there's, there's good things here. Um, and then having another orchestra, so the Vancouver Symphony played it a few years later and it was a different interpretation and a different conductor and a different experience and then hearing it again, uh, not being so close to it being a few years removed and that was a really lovely experience I would say to just um, less sort of interpersonal interactions with the musicians and I don't know if they enjoyed the piece the way the NYO musicians did. But it was also, I think, uh, affirming to hear it again and hear it in a different hall and kind of go like, oh, yeah, I, I, I did OK here. Well, this has been great. I'm going to ask a couple more quick questions and then we'll listen to your pieces. And interestingly, as I was just writing down the, the names for um, so I could remember them, I, you know, as I was writing, you know, Isomorphia National Youth Orchestra as conducted by Alain Trudel, it, it did strike me, isn't it funny that, you know, there's this hierarchy that maybe I'm perpetuating about the, this whole relationship between conductors and orchestras. And then we, we named the orchestra, which is a hundred people. And then we named the conductor who was one person. And, you know, in some situations, not all, but in some, you could insert another capable conductor and the orchestra would sound basically the same. This is not to say that there aren't great conductors and less good conductors, but just that, you know, it's an interesting topic, the hierarchy of the orchestra, the way we view orchestras, the power structure, as, as you alluded to, Emily. So uh, quick answers, maybe a couple sentences. What, is, what does your orchestra look like in 30 years, your ideal orchestra? Maybe I'll just say this. I did this interview last year with some students uh, about uh, sustainability in the arts, all forms of sustainability. And somewhere when I was talking about the orchestra, I said 
burn it all down (laughs) within the context of a bunch of other things and that's all the students pull like multiple students that's the quote they they pulled out none of the other stuff around it um so I'll just say it, it, it will look very different than it does now who's on stage who's making decisions what they're playing where they're playing um Maybe don't burn it all down, but part of me would be okay if that's what needs to happen to um, to enact some 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 much needed change. All right, James, <laughs> are we burning it all down? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe. Um, I think. I mean, classical music has a really interesting kind of function, a dual function of being a living, breathing art form and a means for artistic expression and also being a kind of museum, you know? So like asking if we burn down the orchestra is a bit like, do we burn down the Louvre, you know? And I think there's a case for that, you know? Like maybe we should burn down the Louvre, but also like, no, you know, like that's some pretty, <laughs> there's some pretty cool stuff in there. Like, is there a way that we can kind of like acknowledge the difficulty, you know, like the, oh my gosh, you know, this museum stole objects from other cultures and has kept it for centuries, you know? Like, how do we address that context, which is so embedded in the structure of those kinds of old art forms and institutions like the orchestra, right? So it's a very tricky problem and I certainly don't have an answer to it, but I hope to see the orchestra in 30 years being one that can be more flexible and open and provide, uh, you know, just a more empowering situation for um, the people in it and the people experiencing it rather than one that uh, has an implicit deference to all forms of hegemony. Out of curiosity, is there something that you've encountered recently, a piece of art or what that you would want to share as something that you would you you just think would be really cool for people to check out oh I'll, I'll suggest this and i can't remember the author's name but it's a little small book called your art will save your life um and it's written uh by an american sort of giving all her advice <laughs> to artists in a very succinct little book um And it was written right when Donald Trump was elected. So she's sort of talking about, um, in some senses, survival skills as an artist, but um, just go read it. It's it's great if you're starting out or or wherever you are in your life, um, your art will save your life. James? I really like that new uh, Arca record. Um, if you know Arca, they're a, she's like a Venezuelan electronic producer, um, and it's their third album, and they use a lot more of their voice in it, and it's kind of like a lot more, there's more identity in it in a way, uh, was part of the goal of it, and it's just, I cried so many times listening to it over the last year, so. <laughs> All right, I'm definitely going to check this out. I'm going to check both of those out. <laughs> That's really great. Um, Thank you guys for your time. Uh, You've been super generous. And uh, I'm really grateful for the things that you've shared. Um, I certainly learned a lot of things. Um, We are now going to listen to the National Youth Orchestra. They are going to play Isomorphia, conducted by Alain Trudel. And then we will hear Monograph of Bird's Eyes Views, conducted by Michael Francis.
Hi, I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode as much as we enjoyed making it. And before we go, we would like to acknowledge and thank the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Wendat, for we are currently present in their ancestral lands. We'd also like to thank, as well, any other people or nations who have cared for this land, because care for this land is needed now more than ever. I would like to say a personal thank you to all the artists, activists, and educators who have spent time, so much time, educating me and all of us about how to make a land acknowledgement, why they are important, and really about the next steps that we all need to take. For all your efforts and uh, time and energy, thanks so much. <laughs>